we're on our last in this series, what we need to know about Christianity. And we've looked at uh, somewhere on 12 subjects at, uh, so far about holiness of God, grace of God, these sort of things. We've looked at uh, why God trusts us with money, the fact that uh, God has also trusted us to work and uh, work was a gift to us to work as God works. So, and how in that we become stewards of our money and our work practices. So I hope all these things, all these subjects that we've looked at help us to understand who our God is and what he expects of us and how we should live our lives. And that's what we're looking very much this week. How do we live as a Christian on this earth, in this century, in this place? Why is it that we need to keep on growing in our faith? And finally, we must never forget, we are not individuals, we are part of the body of Christ. So those are the the three things we're going to look at this morning. When we surrender our lives to Christ, the scriptures teach us that we take on a new identity. For some, when they become Christians, that change is dramatic and very noticeable. For the majority of us, the change is slow and over a a course of years and decades that our character changes from what it was before we recognised who Jesus Christ was. There comes a time when I'm sure that many of us, as we look back over the years, think, well, what I'm doing today, I would never have done those years ago. The thoughts that come to your mind about what you're going to do that particular day or week or who you're going to associate with are entirely different to what they would have been if you hadn't met Christ. And that's not unusual for anybody, whether they're Christians or not, because basically we all need the same basics of life. We need food and water. We need shelter. But most important what we need is to be loved and to belong. And that's where being a Christian has got, I believe, lots of advantages. Because as Christians, we should never feel insignificant. Even though life might be unbearable for times and and we go through difficult things, times, places, things are not going our way, there is that sense when we should feel that our future hope to be with God and God's people is secure. In Christ we find ultimate acceptance. In Christ, we experience ultimate security. Before trusting in Christ, says Christopher Hudson, we were God's enemies. But in Jesus, through his death, made it possible for us to be reconciled to our maker. That is, in other words, to be friends with God. And in Christ, who forgives us for all those things that separated us from the love of God 
we find and can find and should know that we are accepted. That's, we learn that because the language of faith teaches us that we become part of God's kingdom. We become part of his family. The Bible refers to us as children of God, followers of God, friends of God. And that is all because of the grace of God. Secondly then, in Christ we experience ultimate security. The world we live in can be very scary at times, like it is for a lot of people at this particular time in our world's history, with these viruses going around and this uncertain weather that's very wet. It's a scary world, but we should believe and know that we are safe in the outcome of our lives. We are born of God and the evil of this world and the evil one can't really touch us and damage that bond that we have with God through Christ. We are free from condemnation. And we should know that the scriptures teach us that we can never be separated from the love of God no matter what happens. All these things become apparent as we grow and mature in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's look up a few scriptures. Where do we find this security? Paul says, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the spiritual blessings that Christ has brought us from heaven. Before the world was created, God had Christ choose us to live with him and to be his holy and innocent and loving people. God was kind and decided that Christ would choose us to be God's own adopted children. God was very kind to us because of the son he dearly loves. And so we should praise God. Look at those those. We are God's adopted children. We all rejoice of what Chris and Jan and their family have experienced at the moment as they are adopting two young children into their family. It's an exciting time. And this is the language that scripture uses, this language of adoption. And in fact, if you think about it, the two children coming into the Ham family will have more certification to prove that they belong to their, the Ham family than most of us will, because all I've got to say that I belong to the Coates family is a one birth certificate. But I assure you, Sarah and Andrew will have a pile of papers this high and will be in court and somebody will pronounce it and laws and everything are written. The paperwork proves that those children will be part of the Ham family forever and it so is with these scriptures. God's own adopted. We are adopted into God's family. That's what the scriptures say. That's pretty wonderful really God wants us to know the security of the relationship we have with him if we give Jesus Christ our lives. Simple as that. Furthermore, we become citizens of heaven. This is what Paul is teaching the Christians at Philippi when he begins the church there and people gather he underlines their security to the kingdom of God because they become citizens 
of heaven. I was talking to my son this week, um, and uh, he works in a big, uh, well, a small company up in the city, and there are a couple of his people who he's employed are becoming citizens. And uh, one of their meetings this week, one of the lads was talking about the questions that they had to answer to become a citizen of this country. So he said to my son, would you like to see if you can answer these questions that I've got to do? And he put about six questions to him and my son couldn't answer any of them. (laughs) I forget what they were now. I didn't write them down. But, you know, if you become citizens of heaven, there's plenty of evidence in the scriptures that that is happening to us. And not only are we adopted children and citizens of heaven, the scriptures tell us, the scriptures tell us we are Christ's ambassadors. Listen to this. God was reconciling the world in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God has made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our security in heaven as adopted children and citizens of heaven make us ambassadors on God's behalf to spread the good news to others that following Christ not only ensures that you belong as children and as citizens, but you'll be given a job as well as being ambassadors to Christ. So who, oops, who are we in Christ? We have, should have in Christ peace with God because of our relationship with God because we understand that we are near to God we've been reclaimed we stand with him we've been chosen adopted we have a relationship we become citizens of Christ and that becomes who we are in Christ we have been set apart by God, to be his ambassadors. We've been set apart because we've been transformed into an image of God. Part of what we do, what we say, is part of who God is. Because we should live in that sense, because we are forgiven. We are full of the Holy Spirit and we've been called to that position by God's grace. And we should celebrate our situation with Christ, who we are in Christ, because we should realise that we are free from the power of sin that holds most others in their burdens and bondages. We're not obligated, we're free, we're not, we don't live under condemnation. All these things point to the fact that we are living as a Christian. We live in ultimate acceptance of who we are and we live within the ultimate security of God's kingdom. That's the first part. But the other point is we must need and know in all this is we just need to know that we need to keep growing in the faith. There is no sense when we can just sit back and say we've arrived. That's it. There's no more of our need to develop our relationship with God, our depth of understanding of who God is. It's an ongoing process. We need to keep growing, otherwise we die away. The Bible is all about 
growing in faith by all, all sorts of means. It's uh, Tyndale famously translated a phrase in the Bible says that we are pioneers and perfectors of the faith. That means we grow in the faith daily. By grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way we life. We need to keep on seeking to develop our relationship like we should develop our relationships with our family and spouses and uh, children. Relationships are important. We all know that. And uh, Paul often taught that uh, he wanted to grow in relationships with those who he was teaching about Christ. That's why he often wrote letters to them in order in to get to know the congregations that he started and were growing in his absence. To, he wanted to hear back from them so there would be mutual encouragement between the two. Your growth in faith encourages me and my growth in faith should encourage you in all sorts of areas. We should keep on encouraging each other to be thoughtful and to do helpful things, to encourage one another, to help one another out. We need to come together to worship together. Paul said in one of his letters, some people he's hearing are forgetting to meet up to worship together. And you can't do that because it's bad not coming together in worship. There is that sense where you cannot develop on your own. We need to be about serious about spending time together because in our worship, as we worship together and seek to help each other and pray for each other, we develop as Christians in that way. It gives us ways to serve one another. My friends, be glad, even if you've had a lot of trouble, you know that you learn to endure by having your faith tested, but you must learn to endure everything so that you will be completely mature and not lacking in anything. If you need wisdom, you should ask God and it will be given to you. There's this sense where we must learn from one another. If we're going through difficulties, we should share them in so the joint experience of growing in Christ in this difficult world helps us that we need to do. And we need to keep on reading the scriptures because faith comes from hearing the word. There's no shortcut from this. Faith comes from hearing the message, says Paul. And that's what we, we need to do. If we think about faith growing and getting to know what the scriptures teach us, we can see something in the life of Abraham. Abraham was one of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament. And as he grew up in the faith, he started from nothing. God called him from a land that didn't worship him to be the father of his people Israel and he set out he put God's trust in he put his trust in God and did as God asked him to he left his home traveled thousands of miles to a new land God promised him a son and a family and yet that was very late in coming to him but he held on to that fact when the opportunity came to worship God and he met 
a prophet of God, then he gave a tenth of all that he had to, that was to Melchizedek, because he believed that that was his rightful thing to do as a person who followed God. So, and he pleaded on the right for God to be tough on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, all sorts of things in Abraham's life that we could talk about. But one incident I think particularly comes to mind where we see Abraham's trust and the way his faith grow, grew was where Lot, his nephew, he went to this land with Lot and they had this big two family bust up really. really. And because there was, in the area they was, they needed more food for their flocks than what is available. And they wanted to split their families to go to spread out a bit. And Abraham was so confident that God was with him, he said to Lot, well, you choose where you want to go. You choose, and if you go that way, I will go the other. And in this story, that's what they did. And we read in Genesis 13 that uh, Lot chose what he could see to be the best land. And he went off in that direction. And Abraham went to where he, the lamb wasn't so productive on first sight. But the reality is that Abraham, because he trusted God for the right outcome of this situation, ended up with more land and more food for his cattle and sheep and everything than Lot did. And in fact, Lot got tied up in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and eventually lost the lot. So that was the faith of Abraham, but his faith grew as he lived out his life with God. And we see the ultimate of Abraham when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain, because that's what he believed God wanted him to do. And God stopped him at the last moment but that was how he grew in grace and knowledge of God and that's what we are called to to do today we are called to grow to get to know God better and we can only do that by reading the scriptures and studying and following through on all the teaching we see and hear about and are recommended to read and that takes time we know children when they come into the world only uh, exist on milk but as they grow they grow onto more solid f fuel food and that's what is true for us today as christians when we start off on the christian life we're on milk but that should grow into solid spiritual food. All these things come through because we spend time with God. And when we spend time with God, setting this time aside, then we grow in love and faith. There's a little bit on how to organise a quiet time. I hope that was helpful. So finally this morning then, we mustn't forget that we are part of the body of Christ. Is uh, Peterson's explanation of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are part of a body of other people. I always remember being told this story that uh, a younger man was uh, feeling lonely and felt he wasn't getting on very well at all. So he went and sought out one of the oldest men in the congregation who seemed friendly and open. And so he made an appointment to go and see this man at his house. So he walked in one afternoon into this house with a nice warm fire 
and sat down and uh, over a cup of tea he poured his heart out about what he thought was going wrong with his life and so uh, when he said all that he wanted to say he just stood and waited for reply which didn't come still the older man got up and took a coal from the fire and placed it in, a heart, in the hearth and just indicated to the young man to keep his eye on it and of course after a little while although the fire continued to rage on this one little coal just got dimmer, dimmer and eventually stopped burning. It could be picked up and put back into the fire. And the young man got up and left and he said, yes, I see now. I need to be part of the rest of the church. And that is so true. We can't be Christians on our own. I'm sure that story came a bit from this uh, quote from uh, a famous old uh, cleric, Sir John of the Cross, when he warned about solitary spirituality. The virtuous soul that is alone is like the burning coal that is alone. It will grow colder rather than hotter if it persists to be on its own. Faith is a we thing, not a me thing. Nowhere in the scriptures is it indicated that we should go off on our own to do our own thing. We are to be part of the body, part of the rest of the church. And that works just for the same as us. We are not. We may gather together as Riverside Church, but we are part of the church in Reading and part of the church in this country and part of the church in the world. We are one body, but there are different members of it doing different things, but we need to come together as a unit to keep that up. None of us are indispensable. We may live in a world where the centre-forward goal scorer gets all the applause all the praise and all the money, but he would be, he needs a team around him. The same for the CEO of a company, whether it's large or small. He may get the biggest paycheck, but without his staff, crew, team or sales staff, he probably wouldn't be the same force. And it's the same in the church. We need to be together. We are part of the body of Christ. We cannot be an individual. And that says, just as each of us has one body with many parts, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, through many, we form one body, and each member belongs to another. I quite like this little film we were trying to do. We're all part of one body. We can't do our own things. We must work together. That's what the scriptures tell us to, we need to do. To lift up that, before we get on to that, yes, so we've looked at living as a Christian and need to keep growing in faith as Christians and we're all part of the body. And that brings this series to an end. Next week it's Lent and we should do something for Lent.